things that I love about coming to England is that you meet people from all over the world. In fact, I'm having a hard time finding out who is a true Englishman. Because even if they are born in England, they have roots other, way, other places in the world. Well, of course, perhaps that's good in itself because it says that we are all one, all members of the same family. Yeah. What's, what's more interesting, though, is that though I feel I have been speaking to the entire world by speaking to South England Conference, and of course to those who are listening or viewing via the internet, the fact is the word of God applies to anybody, anywhere. Isn't it, ama is it amazing that one word from God can speak to thousands, yea, millions of people scattered all over the globe who have never met anybody or never met each other, but yet when the word of God speaks, they can say amen. amen. And you know amen means so let it be. It is true what you're saying. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that Jesus is the amen. amen. So when we say amen, we are actually confirming that Jesus is who he says he is. Yes. Not that he needs our vote. Because he will be Jesus whether we vote him or not. Yes. In fact, he doesn't need our vote to be in office. He, he already is in office. Yes. Help me somebody. Yes. He already is in office. Yes. But we confirm that when we say amen. Amen. I want to let you know that I have really been encouraged by those of you who have come from many times, in many cases, come from every other place but England. <laughs> so thank God for what he is doing in your life. Amen. This morning, because we have been focusing primarily on the theme, the winning way, I thought it best to go to the book of Hebrews, which particularly refers to the race in, of which we are part or in which we run. And I would hope that we can glean something from God's word as we hear his voice this morning. We want to again welcome those of you who are viewing via the internet. And we, I'm going to be making a special call this morning. The Lord has laid upon my heart that even though we are gathered here as Seventh-day Adventists primarily, that I need not take anybody for granted. Because there could be somebody who needs to respond to God in a special way. So I pray that even as God speaks, you would hear what the Spirit says to your heart. Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to read with me verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Please read with me. Let's begin. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us, come on, let's say it again. And let us, run. and let us run. with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and of our faith. Come on, say it with some strength in your voice. Let's begin again, verse 2. Looking, that's much better, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Amen. For our purposes this morning, I'm looking at the subject stripping for the race. Stripping for the race. Just want to acknowledge Pastor Hamilton Williams, fellow Trinidadian, fellow Trini. Um, I feel good to be in your company, sir. You don't know me, I don't think, but I know you. <laughs> and I know of you. Last time I saw you in Trinidad was in Movan. 
Those of you who are not from Trinidad, you don't have a clue as to what I'm talking about, and that's good. <laughs> but I know of you, brother, so be careful. <laughs> Stripping for the race. Let us pray. Father, you have a special word to say to somebody here today. If I would have come all the way from Trinidad just to speak to one person, it would suffice. Amen. So, Father, speak again, for we, your servants, are listening. Amen. 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 It is impossible to examine the text before us without the slightest reference to the ancient games. The ancient Olympics was much or was considered as much a religious festival as it was considered an athletic event. For these games were held in honor of the Greek god Zeus, during which time scores of oxen were sacrificed to him. Games of all kinds were very serious or were considered very serious to the Greeks, especially physical athletic competition. The Greeks believed their gods loved to see strong, fit, and robust bodies. And so in their interest, these Grecians would, or these Greeks would very often find themselves in physical exercise and proper nutrition, and even after the process, they would find themselves oiling their bodies in order to expose the muscularity, that's my word, of their form and physique before the gods. Young men would spend lots of time training and preparing to compete with one another with the hope that they could appease the god Zeus in these, event, in these events. The name Marathon, or the Marathon Race, so named because of one man called Phidippides, who would have run from Marathon to Athens, 26 miles. That's after having run 156 or 150 miles two days before, which was a 36-hour journey. After having run that distance, two days later, he would run from Marathon to Athens to inform his fellow Athenians of the unlikely and unbelievable victory that the Greeks had gained over the Persians. It is said that when this Grecian runner had delivered the message to the Athenians, he then collapsed and died. So every time a marathon is run, it is in his honor. 26 miles after having exhausted himself, he then died. The writer to the Hebrews must have understood that just as you need to be fit to run or participate in the Grecian race, you also need to be fit and to be men and women of stamina to run in the Christian race. Those who won't give up, those who won't give in, those who won't give way to the enemy are the ones Christ looks for in order to run the Christian race. Paul's or the apostle's word to us today is, let us run with patience. The word race comes from the Greek word agon or agon, A-G-O-N which literally means contest. But it was a contest involving strife and, and contention and, and force and, and violence and resistance and opposition, all of which were part of the Grecian race. I imagine whenever they were running, they would sometimes try to ensure that the enemy does not gain the ascendancy. And there would be much violence and force because it was running for a certain kind of prestige and honor. They would therefore encounter all kinds of contention on the race. In other words, once you intended to participate in the race, expect strife. 
Expect contention. Expect resistance. Expect opposition. But in spite of the resistance, in spite of the violence, in spite of the force, in spite of the opposition, Paul says, run. Still run. Don't give up. Keep on running. Don't be filled with despair. Still keep on running. Don't parley with the enemy. Run. I said run. The word agon is the root word of the word agony. A-G-O-N-Y. The, the race was called agon because it was never without agony. Paul says, let us agony with patience. Let us run the race with patience because Paul would have realized that the Christian race, the Christian race comes not without pain and agony. Are you listening to me? It comes not without pain and agony. But we not in the, the difference between this Christian race and the race that the Greeks ran is that we are not running against one another. The only enemy we are running against is ourselves. And just as the Greeks, when they were running, would try to trip the opposition, we have to try to buffet the flesh so that the flesh would not gain the ascendancy. Are you listening to me, church? This is a Christian race that comes not without agony and pain. Once you decide, therefore, to run the Christian race, expect strife. You're not listening to me, church. Ex expect agony. Expect contention. Expect opposition. Don't be shocked when everybody doesn't like you. And some of those who don't like you are the brothers who are in church. Or sisters who are in church. But Paul lets us know that we must expect the strife. Expect difficulty. Expect opposition. What if? They talk about you. Haven't you talked about them? <laughs> the apostle says, think it not strange. Because you are part of the race. Think it not strange when fiery trials try you. It's part of the Christian experience. It's part of the race. Yeah. Some of you who are Valiant in exercising have realized that when you start exercising after a long time, uh, in, a, in a matter of a day or two, your muscles begin to experience pain because they're not accustomed to the stress. When you join the Christian experience, that's what happens when you're not accustomed to the race. You experience pain. But I have learned because I started doing that recently, the more you exercise, the less pain you will experience. Now get this, it's not because there's less stress on your muscles, it's just because your muscles begin to adapt to the stress. <laughs> mm -hmm. Your muscles begin to adapt to the stress. No amount of complaining about the pain removes the pain. Come on, talk to me somebody. No amount of complaining about the pain will keep the pain away. What you got to do to keep the pain away is keep on exercising. And then the pain would be there, but you won't feel it as much because the muscles begin to adjust and cushion the pain so that you can now walk as if you have no pain, even though the stress remains. Well, I've learned a long time ago that God doesn't always remove the stress. But he causes our muscles, our spiritual muscles to adapt to the stress so that we won't feel the pain as we should. How do I know that? He told one prophet one day, he will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Oh, I need some more volume up here. I'm not hearing myself here. He will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. I heard, I heard, I heard apostles saying, be careful for nothing. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And get this, and the peace. 
that passeth all understanding shall guard your heart. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And mine is not that the pain is not there, but the peace. It's not I don't have stress at my home anymore, but the peace. I can still sing, not because you don't fret me, but you're fretting me. doesn't fret me as you used to fret me. <laughs> because the peace which passeth all understanding is guarding my heart so that even though I am going through the storm, I can sleep. I can sleep. I have realized when Jesus was on that boat, it is more difficult, <laughs> it is more difficult for Jesus to calm you. <laughs> oh, I wish somebody heard what I'm saying. Jesus could sleep through the storm because calming the storm was nothing. His sleeping through the storm was his way of teaching us how to behave. Come on, talk to somebody. Uh, and so he was letting us know when we told, when he told Peter, oh, Peter and his boys, oh ye of little faith, huh? don't you see I'm sleeping? But you see, their storm was not what was on the outside, was what was on the inside. Sometimes fear causes a storm that is not there. So Jesus is saying, it's more difficult to calm you. In the midst of the storm, the word patience, he said, let us run with patience. Patience, the word in English doesn't really give the accurate meaning. I used to run the 100 meters when I was much younger. <laughs> I think I was pretty good at it. But I realized in only one, running the 100 meters, all that is required is that you mount up to your fastest speed and maintain that speed as best as you can until you reach the end of the race. It's called a sprint. Mm -hmm. But the Christian race is not a sprint. Because somewhere I read that the race is not for the swift. It's not a sprint. It's a long distance race. So you have to know how to pace yourself. Therefore, you need more strength because there is more stress. Mm -hmm. You need stamina and you need what some people have called stick to itiveness. Be infected by stick to itivism. <laughs> you need to know how to <laughs> you need to know how to endure. The Greek word used there is the word hupomeno, from which we get hypotension. There's a difference between hypertension and hypotension. Hyper is when it's too high, hypo is when it's too low. Hupomeno means literally means remain under. Stay under. Ah, stay under. What, 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 what Paul therefore was saying, regardless of the pressure you, you face, just remain under. You know, hear what I'm saying? Just remain there. Don't give up. Don't, don't give in. It's like a, a, a weight lifter. When he lifts the weight, the longer he stays under, is the more he's rewarded. If he lets go before he's able to remain under, he has given up. And what Paul is saying, you, because Jesus is on your side, he will give you the ability to remain under. Come on, talk to me, somebody. To remain under. So you will go through some stress. You will go through some pain. But in spite of the pain you experience, remain under. Uh, the word, the word, therefore, the word that we get today is that let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This advice comes on the heel of one word, wherefore. Read the text. Wherefore. There is a sermon all by itself with that word. Wherefore. Because it connects what the apostle is saying with what the, the apostle has said. Wherefore. Put it differently, chapter, the reason for chapter 11 is to admonish us in chapter 12. What he said concerning the hall of faith, those faithful brothers and sisters in chapter 11 was to let us know what he's about to say in chapter 12. 
Are you following me? Therefore, he lists all of these outstanding characters, outstanding because they serve an outstanding God. He therefore says, let us run. So wherefore is important to let us know that we can make it because there are others who have gone before. So I spoke about them and their business to let you know that what they experience can be your experience. Abel reminds us that we can be faithful to God even when our older brother doesn't set the right example. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Enoch says to me that though my family walked away from God, I can walk with God. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. Noah says, continue to preach the last day message even if others despise it or don't want to hear it. Abraham says, the Christian journey is taking a journey to a place that you have never been before. And you may wonder, how on earth can I make it on this journey? I have never traveled it before. But Abraham tells us that even though you don't know how you're going to make it, it won't stop you from walking on the journey because it's not how you're going to make it, it's who you're walking with <laughs> that will cause you to survive. Are you listening to me today? Sarah tells me that even though my life is one of emptiness and barrenness, it provides fertile, fertile ground for God's fruitfulness. For the God of omnipotence can stop Abraham from being impotent. <laughs> Hallelujah! Help me somebody, help me somebody. I'm talking about Moses who tells me that affliction with God is sweeter than pleasure with man. Therefore, because you have such a great cloud of witnesses, you can run. They are forerunners. Therefore, you can run. Let us run with patience. If they can make it, we can make it. Because they are men and women of like passions. If they can face it like Daniel did, I can face the enemy like Daniel did. Because Daniel's God is my God. Help me, somebody. He is the same God of the Daniel, of the Hebrew boys, and he is the same God today. In spite of what I may go through, I can endure it because they endure it. Thank you, Jesus. It should interest all of you to know that women, with all due respect, were never invited to these games. To the Greek, ancient Greek games. They were never invited as spectators or as participants. I had to ask why. Please stay with me, this is important. Because we're now entering into the meat of the message. They were never invited to the games. And there were two reasons. One, for religious reasons, the entire body of men were exposed. So when men ran these races, they often ran naked. That would have been a sight to see. <laughs> the Greeks <laughs> believed that their gods wanted to see the bodies of men in its purity, quote unquote. So they had to expose their bodies to the Greek gods. The second reason they ran naked is because less weight <laughs> meant less encumbrance. It therefore meant that it gave the athlete a greater chance of performing at his best. You must appreciate that they didn't have the sophisticated outfits that we now wear for the Olympics. They were long and, and, and cumbersome outfits that they were wearing. And these outfits would keep them back. So instead of wearing anything that would keep them back, they would go naked to run at their best. A weight, therefore, was not necessarily anything that was heavy, bulky, or cumbersome. It didn't have to be large. A weight to the apostle's mind was anything that impeded your progress. Hmm anything that hindered you from going forward. Maybe some of you who have been jogging, who have jogged before, will understand 
that there are times when you are running and you have to stop because there's some, something in your shoe. Mm -hmm. And when you take out, the, take out your foot from the shoe, you discover it was a little pebble. Have you ever experienced that? A little stone that caused you to stop. A little pebble. It only took a pebble. It was little, but it was big enough to slow you down. A little pebble, but it was big enough to cause you to stop. Mm, this is a lesson in itself. Because what started off as a little kiss <laughs> caused you to be pregnant out of wedlock. Oh, you're mighty quieter now. Mm -hmm. uh, what started off as a little act got you into big trouble with the law. What started off as a little word got you into big trouble. What started off as a little deed has caused you your marriage. Cost you your marriage. What started off as a little habit now has your family in shambles. I have learned that the devil doesn't need anything too grand or too great to bring us down. Mm. A weight is a weight once it keeps you down. One man described it this way. Whatever is not a wing, it is a weight. What does he mean by that? Whatever is not lifting you up is bringing you down. Do I have a witness here? You see, sometimes your weight could even be your job. Your weight could be an, an exam that you have to sit because it's, it is more important than God. Sometimes it stops you from worshiping God. You see, very often when we need something from God, we know how to pray passionately for that, in, that, that thing. But once we get it, we pray passionately for a job that now keeps us in bed on Sabbath. Because it's so good. We used to believe in faithfulness to God, but now the job is paying too much. So we can't return what belongs to God. It just takes a small little act to get you down. Whatever is not lifting you up is bringing you down. That relationship that you have, if it's not helping you, it is hurting you. That boyfriend or that girlfriend that you have, if he or she is not lifting you up, he is bringing you down. Sorry to be the one to tell you, but that's what the word of God says. That habit that is not doing you any good will destroy your life. Whatever in the Christian race is preventing us from progressing will keep us down. There are some people you can't afford to run with. I said there are some people you can't afford to run with. Some of them are in church. I'm serious. You see, I believe we are on the final stretch of this Christian race. And some people are going to distract you. Believe it or not. Sometimes you come to church and you want to hear a sermon. And just at the time when God is about to speak to you, somebody nudges you. Look what she's wearing. And you miss God's word. Am I talking to anybody here today? Huh? Sometimes the people you hang out with, because they're not wings, they are wet. And the Greeks were willing to lay aside anything for the sake of the race. Hallelujah. We must be willing to lay aside everything that would be a weight. I remember when I used to run with a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. We used to run about two or three miles ever so often. And I remember one day, it was a little tough for me running. And as I was running, I, would, I was running, I was looking at him, my friend. And because he looked as if he was so much into the race, I didn't want to disappoint him because he was my friend. And just the way he was running caused me to have energy to run because I didn't want to embarrass myself. And I didn't want him to look better than me. <laughs> so the way he ran encouraged me. And it happened ever so often. I met him a few years ago. And we were reminiscing about the times we used to run together. And I would tell him, remember the, time, remember the times we used to run X, Y, Z? And I, I, yeah, yeah. I said, remember the time I used to look at you? you know, I, there was a time I used to look at you and you didn't even know. I would look at you and because of the way you were running, it inspired me to run. We must associate with friends who can inspire you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, would, you would inspire me to run and because of the way you were running, it caused me to run as fast as you were running. 
to my amazement, he said, the same thing happened to me. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, no, no. It was the other way around. The way you were running caused me to run. Hallelujah. I believe what happened. I know what happened. When I saw him, it inspired me to run at the time that he was losing ground. And when I started to run, it inspired him to run. I am saying you need to have friends who can be wings, who can lift you up, who can inspire you. On the other hand, there are some who tell you can't make it. There are some who tell you don't waste your time. There are some who tell you it's all right. God understands if you're involved in your besetting sin. And the reason why they say that is because they are involved. No, I'm serious. Anybody who encourages you or does not discourage you from sin is in sin. I'm going to say it again. Anybody who knows you are sinning, who knows you are living in sin, but does not encourage you out of sin, is because they themselves are in the... Now, you can't say amen because you might be that friend. I said, if you can't say amen, say... All right. But I hear Jesus as I come to a close. I hear Jesus saying something else. Lay aside every weight and that sin that so easily beset us. Because you see, everybody has that sin. Your sin problem may not be my sin problem. But you've got to lay aside that sin that so easily beset you. That anger that so easily beset you. That bitterness because you don't want to forgive that easily beset you. You're so bitter that when you come to church, you can never enjoy praising God because the one you should forgive is right up there on the pulpit. <laughs> and you're mad, vexed, and you wonder why he's up there all the time. Huh? I'm telling you, church, we have come too far. I have come too far to let anybody steal my crown. Yeah. Hallelujah. You're not going to steal my crown. You can say what you want. I'll keep on running. I'll keep going on. Because the race, the race is to be won. Jesus won so that I can win. Yeah. Oh. So let us. Lay it aside. Lay aside the forgiveness. Lay aside the bitterness. By the word, by the way, the word forgiveness means send it away. <laughs> so when you don't forgive, it's because you're keeping it. So send it away. Just forgive them. Even if they haven't asked for forgiveness, forgive them anyhow. Ask God to help you love them. The reason why God keeps using them in your face is so that you can learn how to forgive. Amen. Looking unto Jesus. I said looking unto Jesus. At these long distance races, a judge would normally stand at the finish line holding up the winning prize, which was oftentimes a laurel wreath to be crowned or to be placed as a crown upon the victor's head. He would stand at the finish line with the prize lifted up. And very often when the runners came around the final turn, exhausted some of them, discouraged some of them, in agony and in pain some of them. But as they saw the laurel wreath, as they saw the prize set before them, <laughs> as they saw the object of their running, the purpose for which they ran, they will be renewed with a new burst of energy. Are you hearing me, church? And then they will start to run with a different fervor. It can't be long now. He is right there. It is right there. It's going to be mine. And so they will keep their eyes on the prize. Uh, they would not be so concerned about those who are on their left or right, but they keep looking on to the prize. The, the apostle says, look on to Jesus, for he is the author and the finisher of our faith. The word author is not one who writes a book. The word author means the one who initiated the race, the one who had the gun in his hand. He started the race. That's why you are here. Jesus started you. It wasn't, with all due respect, it wasn't a preacher that brought you here. It was God who brought you here. 
It's God who's put his spirit within you so that you can be in the church. If God didn't open your ear, it doesn't matter what the preacher said. You would not have heard. But God, his spirit, started the race. But guess what? He said, I started the race, but I'll also be at the finish line <laughs> waiting for you to come. Because I am the author and I'm the finisher of your faith. Because I ran a similar race. I ran that race while I was down here uh, on the earth. I ran people scorn at me they spat at me they whipped me they say all manner of evil against me but they call me everything else but the son of God but I kept on running I set my face towards Jerusalem because that was the object of my running I went to the cross and just like Pheidippides who fell down and collapsed when he delivered the message I did not collapse I just gave up the ghost <laughs> hallelujah I gave up the ghost because no man can take my life. It wasn't because I was tired. It wasn't because they nailed uh, me on the cross. It was because I just decided now is time. It is done. The race is won. And because I won, you can win. Yeah. Do I have a witness here? Yeah. You can win. Yeah. That's why it's called the winning way. Once you are on this race, you win. I said, you have won. Amen. You have won the race. Amen. Don't give up. Why come to church and be lost? Amen. You might as well stay home in your chalet. Amen. In fact, pack up your bags now and leave. Amen. It doesn't make any sense that we come to church every Sabbath and we hear God's word and we're upset Amen. because things are not going the way we expect. What if we are all imperfect creatures? Things will not always go as they should, but I know somebody who is perfect. And he tells me, don't look onto the pastor. With all due respect, sometimes you've got to baptize or rebaptize the one who baptized you. <laughs> but don't look onto the pastor. You may like him, you may admire him, but he is not the one who initiated your race. Look onto Jesus. He is the author and he is the finisher of your faith. Hallelujah! That's why I tell people, you can't put me out of this church. Even if you excommunicate me, you can't disfellowship me in the truest sense. Because Jesus is the one who brought me here. And he has the keys. Not only does he have the keys, he is the door. So you can't put me out. Things may not go right. You may fall down. And sometimes you've got to grind the mill because you fell down. But even as you grind the mill, keep looking. Keep looking unto Jesus. He will remain the author and finisher of your faith. So my appeal this morning is how many of you want to run? Don't just walk, run. He will give you the energy. How many of you really want to run this Christian race? It's a journey filled with agony. Sometimes it might make you visually impaired. And you may experience pain even up to last night. But don't give up the fight. Don't give up the race. It might cause you to take a series of operations that may have you weeping before the altar. But don't give up the race. All of us have pain in different ways. Some of us, we have physical pain. Some of us have emotional pain, but don't give up the race. We can still run with patience. It's not a sprint, but it's a race with patience. Patience. But it's a race that has already been won. And because it has been won, he gave us the victory.